This morning, dear brothers and sisters, I would like to share with you this message entitled, Set Your Hearts on Things About, Applying God's Word to Our Lives. The psalmist said in, in the scriptures that the entrance of God's word brings light and understanding. And I believe as we look into this passage of scripture that is before us today, in the book of Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 4, I believe uh, God by his spirit would bring light and understanding into our lives as we build our lives and as we continue in this journey of following Jesus through this year. So I'd like us to read from Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. As we come to his word, let's just ask the Lord in prayer to enlighten our eyes and to give us understanding as we hear his word being spoken. Father in heaven, we just come before you and we pray, Lord, let the entrance of your word into our hearts bring light and bring understanding. And we humbly ask you, Lord, that we will not just be mere hearers of your word today, but Lord, we will resolve in our hearts to apply in our daily lives your word each day. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you look carefully at the verses in Colossians 1 through 4, which we just read, we will see that uh, the Apostle Paul begins this little section with a kind of a reminder. So he starts with a reminder. He is reminding the people at Colossae of who they once were and what has happened to them since then. He says, since then, you have been raised with Christ. In other words, you are saying, if there has to be a resurrection, there has to be a death. So you were once dead, he says. You were spiritually dead. right? We too, in a way, in a time we can remember, were dead in our way. In, Spiritually, we were following our own ways. We were rebelling against God. We were doing our own things. That was our life. And that's what, the, that, that's what, the, what was the testimony of our lives. And spiritual death. We were spiritually dead. And what do you see here? We find that he says, you've been raised with Christ. In other words, you've been given the new life. A new beginning. You've been given a new birth. A new spiritual birth. You and I, through what Christ did for us, have been actually been made alive spiritually. So there's been a spiritual death and a spiritual birth. And how did it, how was this possible? Simply because of the atoning work of Jesus Christ. You and I have been made new. And so all of our purpose and all of our power is centered in Christ. All that we can and that we are and can do is simply because of what Christ is doing in our lives. All of our hopes will be realized in and through Christ and Christ alone only. So we have a reminder to begin with and then he follows the reminder up with a command. And the command is very simple. The command is to apply the word of God in our lives, to make God's word a practical reality in our lives. I believe all of us read our Bibles and study our Bibles, but the very purpose of reading and studying and reflecting and meditating on God's word ought to be that we bring it down to applying it in, in our lives. In simple words, 
I read my Bible, you read your Bible, you study your Bible. And then you look at what the scripture is telling you to do. Simple thing is, what is a scripture text telling me to do, to say or to think? That's what I like to do when I read my Bible. And that's what we ought to do so that we ask ourselves this question. What is it that God's word is asking me to think, do or say? And just make then that an application to do what it says we must do. In this particular scripture passage that we have before us, we find uh, the instruction is set your hearts on things above. Set your hearts on things above. As we hear it, it just tells us that it's speaking of our priorities and what our priorities in life ought to be. It goes on to repeat, it says, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Again, it speaks of our focus. So on one hand, we have our priorities that we need to think about, and we, have our, we need to think about our focus. And the truth that is tied up here is that our focus and our priorities no longer, must no longer be centered in the things of the earth. Rather, they must be centered on Christ and on the things of God. That's the premise. That's what the word of God is trying to communicate to us this day. Now, we will all understand and we will all know that this, of course, is a very real challenge. Because we still live in a real world with its struggles and stresses and challenges and problems. Focusing on spiritual things does not remove our stress and our struggles altogether. But it certainly will make a huge difference in our ability to thrive in our lives. That's what God wants for our lives, that we will thrive in our lives. We will live wholesome, full lives. Isn't that what Jesus said when he said, I've come that you may have life and life in its fullness. And he wants us to experience that sense of wholesome life here on earth itself. And that's why it's imperative that we will be setting our hearts on things above. Our focus ought to be clear. We'll be setting our hearts and our minds on things above. Our priorities and our focus is something that we need to look at today. We understand what this means. The point really is, what do you and I need to do practically to set our hearts and minds on things above? What is it? What are those things that you and I need to practice to reorder our priorities and to refocus our lives. I believe a new year has begun. It's a new beginning. Right? What must we do so that we can reorder our priorities and refocus our lives? Today I'd like to share with you five practices that will enable us to live a more spiritually focused and a wholesome life this 2021. Five practices that we could begin to follow in our lives on a daily basis. Practice number one. You must choose where to set your heart and mind. You must choose where you would want to set your heart and mind. Where to set your heart and your mind is a choice. On whom and what to set your heart and mind on is a choice. And it's a choice that every one of us must make. Your emotions, your trials, your earthly situation, circumstances can bear upon you and can drive your affections and thoughts. 
In fact, all that happens around us, our challenges, our circumstances, our trials, our, our emotions, everything, every one of them can actually drive our thoughts and our affections. And they can trick us into thinking that we do not have a choice. We do not have a choice. Well, you think my failures of my past well tells me that I don't have a choice. Or my past family background tells me that I don't have a choice. I would just follow in this thing. That we don't have a choice. They scream to us and tell us. But the reality is the truth that God's word tells us is that we have a choice. It's much easier for us to do everything and anything that the crowd does and for us to join the crowd. But we have a choice and we must exercise that choice every day. That's what we see in the scriptures through the characters of the Bible. That they have to make a choice and so do we. God's word tells us we have a choice and we have to make that choice. You have to set your heart and mind on Christ and on the things above. I have to do the same as well. We have a choice to let go of our earthly mindset and look to live with a heavenly mindset in and through all situations of life. My dear brothers and sisters, you must choose where to set your heart and mind. Because everything that we would do will follow as a result of the choice that we make. So I like to really urge you today that, that you would choose to set your hearts on things about, on Christ and on the things of God. That's practice number one, your choice that you have before you. Practice number two, feed your mind with God's word daily. Feed your mind with God's word on a daily basis. I think this is so important. We need to make a choice whether we will feed our mind with God's word daily or we will feed our mind with the things of the world daily. That's again a choice. So we need to think about what are we feeding our minds with? God's word on a daily basis or the ways of the world on a daily basis? I believe as humans, we believe that we are capable and self-sufficient of taking care of the things of our lives. Many times we tend to rely a lot on our own wisdom and understanding. We are more inclined to follow our own ways instead of the ways of God. Now feeding our minds with God's word daily will arm us with truths to overcome our desire to stay connected with the ways of the world and its patterns. So if we choose and we make the choice to feed our minds with God's word daily, you know, we will be able to overcome our desire to stay connected with the ways of the world. And if we don't practice this, we will actually be naturally inclined and disposed, dis, uh, disposed to actually being able to follow the ways of the world. I believe we all have meals every day, probably more than three for many of us. The reason we take meals is that we, our body will receive nourishment. So just as our bodies require daily nourishment, so does our spirit. We need daily nourishment for our souls. And where can we get that nourishment? We need nourishment for our souls. And where can we find it? Someone offers an answer to that question. I believe we're all familiar with it, Psalm, Right? Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of mockers. I'd like you to focus on this verse that follows now. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. 
Now, I like you to look at your life as two trees, right? On one side, one hand, a tree that is actually growing in a very parched place, a land that has been hit with drought, right? A tree that's only a stem that stands up. You find the leaves have almost withered away. It's already dying. That's one picture. Imagine this kind of a tree. On the other hand, I'd like you to look at another tree that is growing in a place where there are streams of water by its side. It's lush, it's green, right? It's able to draw nourishment for itself from the soil and from the streams. And you find that this tree has leaves that stay there and in its season, it bears fruit and is very fruitful. On one side, a tree that's dying, that's actually coming up in a parched land with no access to soil, no nutrition from soil, no streams of water by its side. On the other hand, a tree that's flowering and is fruitful and is green. What picture do you see of yourself? What tree are you? Here, the psalmist says, that someone who delights in God's word and his law is like this tree that's green, flowering, bears fruit. It's beautiful. It's well fed, well nourished. And that's, the, that's what feeding our minds and our lives with God's word on a daily basis will do. It will cause us to be green, cause us to be for bearing fruit. And that's why I want to encourage each of us today to make this our priority. That this year, this new year, we will actually prioritize to spend time every day with the Lord. We will have a consistent time and a place to meet with God. That we would spend more time reading and reflecting on scripture and in prayer. So important. And it's something that needs to happen daily as a practice. As a discipline in our lives. Because more than anything else. If you look at the life of Jesus. You will find that he always found time. To be connected with his heavenly father. Jesus understood the importance. And his life communicates to us the importance. Of having and building. A very intimate relationship with our heavenly father. And that's why he often made time to be alone with God. And I think we need to follow his example. Ministry was not the first thing that Jesus prioritized. Right? Being everywhere and all over the place and doing a lot many things is not what was priority first for Jesus. He was really focused on building his life and his relationship with the Father. And I think we need to do the same. We need to feed our minds on God's word and be able to commune with him so that we will build a life we will have a life that is soaked in the Lord himself. Choose, you must, where to set your heart and mind. Feed, we must, our minds with God's word on a daily basis and commune with him. Practice number three is examine your thoughts continuously. Examine your thoughts continually. Someone has rightly said that the mind, your mind and my mind is the real battleground. Every day we are bombarded with thoughts. Every day, day in, day out. Right? There is so much of information being downloaded into our minds every day. And this information that's been brought to us, this news or whatever you may call it, 
is intended to capture our minds and our imagination the world wants us to get so caught up so engrossed with these things and the reason they want us to do that is so that they will keep us glued to the doctrines that they propagate through these things and also that they would keep our time that our time would be spent in being able to savor all these things that come our way the whole idea is to get hold of your mind the whole idea is to captivate and capture our minds it is to help it is devised so that we will be able now we will be conditioned in the way we think and the way we think would be the way the world wants us to think the patterns of the world the desires of the world these are the things that we will begin to follow then and so it's important for us therefore to examine our thoughts and our thought patterns on a daily basis it's important that we pay attention to our thoughts and our thought patterns the moment you hear something does your mind jump to worst case scenarios about people or situations or do you frequently find yourself thinking negative thoughts outside of what is real Or are you thinking all the time about things that may re- may may or may never really happen? And as you stay focused on these things, doesn't it just make you tired? I actually call this wasted emotional energy. And so, I like to urge you that we would work hard to avoid wasting any of this energy on thoughts that are untrue and about things that will likely never happen it's important that we will be able to examine our thoughts and to filter those ones that are going to lead us down a path of lies it's so very important the bible also says that just as a man thinketh so he is everything sin begins and is conceived in the mind and that's why our minds are is the bar the battle is the battleground uh the our thoughts and our thought patterns will eventually lead us to do the things in bring it into action to pass so it's important that we apply and filter out those things those thoughts that are not going to build us up It's important that we learn to capture lies and untruth and replace them with the things that are pure and truthful. I like to ask you this. If someone were to get hold of your cell phone and were able to look at all the image galleries in your in your phone or someone were to were to track what you what you're browsing on and searching for would you be embarrassed what are the image galleries you've conjured up in your mind not just on your phone it's so important it's time that we would replace those image galleries of untruth and lies with something that is pure and truthful I like us to challenge ourselves. Lord, this 2021 help me to examine my thoughts continually, to look at my thought patterns and to be able to filter everything that comes my way. And to be thinking on those things that are pure, noble, praiseworthy rather than thinking on the things of the world and the things that the world wants us to look into examine your thoughts on a continual basis because what do you think you will be practice number 4 so we go through three you must choose where to set your heart and mind on your choice is important practice number 2 feed yourself daily 
with God's word and commune with him and filter, examine and filter your thoughts continuously. And now for practice number four. Keep your heart pure. Keep your heart pure. I believe any mechanic will be able to tell you and me that a clean engine runs better and delivers more power than a dirty one. And the same is true of a heart that is kept pure or a pure heart. In the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8, the Lord Jesus himself said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. That simply means that we as kingdom people ought to really develop and practice and cultivate kingdom attitudes. That's what this whole sermon is about. And what it says here is that we have to work we have to work to keep our hearts pure. It requires real hard work. What that means is, we have to choose if we will collect and retain all kinds of garbage in our hearts, or we will work to get rid of them. Now, you know, we have this habit many a times, we just uh, collect and retain all kinds of things in our hearts. Things like evil desires, resentments, perhaps you've collected them, now you have a bag full of it. Your jealousy and hatred, and even entertaining thoughts of revenge, they're working in your heart. All of these things, we must realize, will eat away at us like cancer. So, we have a choice to make here as well. Would we work to keep or get rid of those things that will actually make our heart dirty or will we work towards putting out those things or getting rid of those things in our hearts so that we can keep and have a clean heart? Will you choose to retain those things that poison your hearts and block your ability to see God and experience a vibrant spiritual life or will you work to get rid of of them. Listen to the Apostle Paul writing in Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 10 now. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. And he goes on to list sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires. And greed, which is idolatry. Just pause for a moment there. I believe none of us really actually worship idols. And we say, well, we don't have an idol in our house and we don't worship and we don't bow down before an idol. Good. But what the Apostle Paul says here is that greed is idolatry. So if you're greedy, if greed kinds to dominate the landscape of your life, it's as good as saying that you are an idolater and the idol is what you are greedy after. He goes on, because of these that he mentions, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. So he's talking to the Colossians saying, once upon a time, this is how you're walking in your lives. But now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these. He says, now you need to really rid yourselves. There's no way that you can say, I'm going to set my hearts on things above, or I'm going to set my minds on things above, and continue to collect and retain all of these things. He says, you must rid yourselves of all such things. And again, he goes on the list. What is it that we need to get out of our hearts? Anger, rage, getting mad with anger, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, 
Sins you have taken of your old self with its practices. And have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here he makes clear what actually separates a person who actually is following Christ in the real sense and following himself in another sense. It's very clear. The old man lives according to the things that of the ways of old and the practices that he has been following. The new man takes off the old man, the old practices, and begins to do and follow those things that is demanded of God, that is required of God in his life. So we need to ask ourselves this question. Am I working to keep my heart pure? What is it the Lord would see when he looks at your heart and my heart? Well, I'm not trying to say that this is easy by any means. In fact, the Apostle Paul also talked about this very real struggle to do what he knew was right. So this is a real struggle. Even the Apostle Paul and everyone had it and I believe we all have faced this. I also can testify to the fact that it is difficult, it's not at all easy for me to keep my heart and life pure. But what we are commanded here and what we are told should, we should be doing is that we, this practice must be an ongoing priority. It's not so much about what we do outside and the ministry things that we do. The point really is this must be a priority. A priority would, should be that we are going to fight and we're going to keep our hearts pure. And the Apostle Paul in that very chapter in Romans 7 concludes that God will give us the relief and the resources we need to develop a pure heart. The Lord will give us the relief and the resources to develop a pure heart. Listen to Romans chapter 7 verses 24 and 25. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. Perhaps we can find ourselves in this. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? And this is his answer. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. There is relief and there is resources. Thank God that there is hope for us. That as we set our hearts on Christ, He will enable us to keep our hearts and our lives pure. Keep your heart pure. And practice number five. Make today count. Make today count. Make each day count. In fact, if you go to think about it, all that we have is only today. And even I may say, it's not just today, but it's just the moment that we have. Because we do not know what the next moment holds. So we have to be able to make today count. Because we do not have and we do not know about a tomorrow. Nor we can do anything about our yesterday. So how do you make today count? We got to learn to leave the past behind. I think all of us have something sinful and negative in our past that has the potential to immobilize us, to paralyze us, if we allow it to. 
I believe failures, hurts, disappointments happen and have happened to all of us. But God does not want us to dwell on them and then make a mess of the today. What God wants is that we come to him for forgiveness and for healing about the pain and regret of the yesterday. And this forgiveness is God's gift to us so that we can walk in the newness of life. That we can continue to set our hearts on him and on things above. So that we can forget those things in the past and be able to live in the present. So to make every day count, to make today count, let's learn to put the past behind us and live in the present, in the today. You and I can do nothing about the past. And then, don't worry about tomorrow. Leave the past behind and don't worry about tomorrow. In fact, the one thing that we worry so much is about tomorrow and what tomorrow will bring. We are actually completely overwhelmed with the potential for pain and anxiety and disappointment and challenges that tomorrow can bring. In fact, Jesus gave us a prescription to face the uncertainty of tomorrow. This is his prescription. In Matthew 6 verses 25 to 27, three times He gives us the prescription. His prescription was very simple. Stop, stop worrying. Saying don't worry about tomorrow and what tomorrow will bring. Jesus was promising something. He said, God knows what we need. And that God will provide what we need. He was saying that's the promise. God knows what you need. And he will provide what you need. But you and I have a job to do. And our job, though difficult it might be, is to trust God and to seek his kingdom first. The same word, seek the things about. Set your hearts on things above. Seek the kingdom of God. Seek the king and the things of the kingdom. That's our job. If we have to learn to live in the present and make this day count, this moment count, then we have to stop worrying about tomorrow and start to set our minds and seek the things of God above. I'm not pretending that this is easy at all. But I'm certain that there is no better way that you and I can follow. There's no better practice. Let us resolve in our hearts that we will make each day count. Worry does not empty tomorrow of sorrows. It empties today of strength, said Corrie ten Boom. Worry does not empty tomorrow of sorrows. It empties today of strength. Our only hope and help is in trusting the Lord today. Whatever we may face in the new year, we will be better off if we make it a priority To leave the past behind. Forget and not to worry about the future. Like I said a while ago, the only day we have and literally the only moment we have is now. We are not promised tomorrow, not even the rest of the day, the moment. So it's imperative that we practice making every moment in our lives count. Psalm 118 verse 24 says, This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. That's the resolve. This is the moment. This is the day that God has given unto us. Let us learn to rejoice and be glad in it. 
we can thank God and rejoice in each day and ask God to guide us and help us to make each day count. When you and I focus on one day at a time, it will free us from the burden of the past and the worry of the future. Make today, this moment, count. Make every moment count. Perhaps you may not recognize or know this man. His name is James L. Kraft. And he was a founder of the Kraft Foods. And here is a man who put into practice the practices we're talking about. But the way it started was not the way we see it. When Kraft was a young man, he had the desire to be the most famous manufacturer and cheese salesman in the world. His goal was to become rich and famous. He began his business with a little buggy pulled by a pony by the name Paddy. Each day, he took his cheese and he and Paddy went down the streets of Chicago selling cheese. So here was James Kraft with his buggy and with his pony named Paddy selling cheese on the streets of Chicago. Months passed. And the young man became desperate. He began to despair because he was not making any money in spite of long hours and hard work. One day he pulled his pony to a stop and began to talk to him. He said, Paddy, there is something wrong. We don't seem to be doing it right. I'm afraid we've turned things around. Our priorities are not what they ought to be. Here is James Craft talking to Paddy, his pony. Right? Our priorities are not what they ought to be. Maybe we ought to serve God and place him first in our lives. Craft that day drove home, and when he drove home, he made a covenant that for the rest of his life, he would first serve God, and then he would work as God would direct him. Many, many years later, after much success, Kraft said this, I would rather be a layman serving in the church than to be the head of the greatest corporation in America. My first job is serving Jesus. I believe we need to come back to this reality that without God, our life is meaningless. Without God, our purposes are absolutely meaningless. Without God, our pursuits would have no meaning. The best of life and eternity are wrapped up in God. And therefore, to set our hearts on Him and on things above is the best thing that we can ever do. Colossians 3 and verse 4 reads, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Our life is hidden with Christ. Our life is in Christ. We have no life apart from Christ. And all that we are commanded in scripture to do is that we will practice those things that will cause us to tell the Lord himself that we mean business and that is to set our hearts on him and the things above. Because when Christ our life will appear, we will also appear with him in glory. That's our hope 
And that's what we wait for. That we will also appear with our life, who is Jesus Christ, when he appears. And I believe that ought to be a focus, that we live for him. And all that we do is so that we can bring him pleasure. That yes, we have set our hearts on him and things about. I would like us to pray now. And I would like us to look at our lives in the light of what we have heard. This is not about some theory. This is about practices that will tell the Lord that we really are serious about following him and being his disciples. It all begins with choice. You must choose where you're going to set your heart and mind on. You must choose whether you're going to feed your minds with God's word daily or you're going to just feed your minds with the things of the world. You've got to choose, and I've got to choose if I will let the world lead me with its thoughts and thoughts patterns, or I will be willing to examine my mind and be able to filter out those things that will cause me and will lead me down a path of lies, examining our minds continually. Would I want work towards keeping a pure heart, one that God would look down and be greatly pleased with? Would that be your priority this year? Would, that, would you make that your focus? And that's going to be our prayer. And we're not going to live in the yesterday or in the tomorrow, but we will live in the today and make every day count for the Lord Jesus Christ. Shall we just close our eyes and we want to pray together and resolve in our hearts the grace that God would give us that we want to make setting our hearts on things about a practice in our daily lives. Heavenly Father, we just come before you. Lord, we just acknowledge that you have given us new life. You have redeemed us. You have turned around our lives. Lord, your gift of salvation is a beautiful gift to us. And Lord, you also call us that we live out our lives, that new life, that we enjoy the newness of life that you've given to us each day. Father, you're calling us to choose to take our eyes of the things of the earth and to set our hearts and our minds on things above. To fix our gaze upon you. So we pray, Lord, that Lord, give us grace that we may make that choice to intentionally take our eyes off, our gaze off, our focus off, the things of the earth, and to fix it on you, Lord. Lord, we ask you, Father, that you would give us the grace that we will work, Lord, empowered by your Spirit, to keep our hearts pure, to get rid of those things that clutter and dirty our lives and our hearts. Father, pray that each one of us would resolve in our hearts that we want to follow those practices that you've asked of us. Impress on our hearts, Lord, that we need to live for you each day and make every day count. 
And we pray, Father, that as we do that, you, O Lord, will be glorified and magnified through our lives. And people will see that in, in the midst of all of these situations that we face, we can experience a wholesome life, a life that's filled with joy, a life that is filled with hope because you are our life and our hope. Father, I pray for our brothers and sisters who hear this word that Lord, this year, we would Lord, practice more and more of your word in our lives that we'll apply it. Father, I pray your blessing upon every one of these people. And I ask you, give us grace to do your will, to apply your word in our lives. This I ask and pray in Jesus' name. And everyone say, Amen. Let's just uh, share the blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us and enable us to follow and apply His Word to our lives. In Jesus' name, Amen and Amen.